primary purpose of Spartan education, and indeed of Spartan society as a whole, differed greatly from that of the Athenians. The primary goal of Spartan education was to produce good soldiers. Training for the military began at age seven, as all Spartan boys left home to go to military school. From then until the time they were 18, they were subject to harsh training and discipline. Historical accounts tell of Spartan boys as being allowed no shoes, very few clothes, and being taught to take pride in enduring pain and hardship. Throughout their adolescent and teenage years, Spartan boys were required to become proficient in all manner of military activities. They were taught boxing, swimming, wrestling, javelin throwing, and discus throwing. They were trained to harden themselves to the elements. At the age of 18, Spartan boys had to go out into the world and steal their food. Getting caught would result in harsh punishment including flogging, which was usually a practice reserved only for slaves. The concept was that a soldier must learn stealth and cunning. At age 20, Spartan men had to pass a series of demanding tasks of physical prowess and leadership ability. Those that passed became members of the Spartan military and lived in barracks with the other soldiers. They were allowed to take a wife, but they weren't allowed to live with her. At age 30, they became full citizens of Sparta, provided they had served honorably. They were required to continue serving the military, however, until age 60. Unlike their Athenian counterparts, Spartan girls also went to school at age 7. There they learned gymnastics, wrestling, and did calisthenics. These schools were similar in many ways to the school Spartan boys attended, as it was the Spartan opinion that strong women produced strong babies, which would then grow into strong soldiers to serve the state. Somewhat ironically, women in Sparta had much more independence than women in other city-states, partially because their husbands never lived at home, and partially because Spartans had tremendous respect for Spartan mothers. While no marvelous works of art or literature ever came of this system, it did accomplish the Spartan goal of producing elite soldiers. The Spartan military was universally disliked, but they were also universally respected. And with that being read, I want to welcome you back to the 127 Fit Podcast. Today's guests are the owners of Spartan Barbell, a powerlifting gym, created by, by powerlifters for powerlifters in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Today's guests are Joe and Samantha Todd. Joe and Samantha, I want to welcome you to the 127 Fit Podcast. Thanks for having us. We appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. So I just want to kind of dig in um, here in the beginning in regards to kind of your guys' background. Um, we'll start with you, Samantha, and then uh, Joe, if you kind of want to uh, share a little bit about your background as well. That'd be great. But just kind of share with our listeners kind of like where you guys grew up and then maybe if you want to share um, about kind of how you got into lifting weights and strength training and powerlifting and, and things of that nature. So um, I started actually lifting when I was five years old. Um, my dad has been a bodybuilder, powerlifter since I've known him. So um, He started me and my sister in our garage and he built our own gym for us. We went from there, and then we went to gymnastics, and then in middle school, we actually competed in fitness competitions. Um, and then from there, in high school, I kind of did a little bit of cheerleading, and then went to school for, uh, I got my major in exercise science and health promotion. Um, still worked out a little bit, but not a lot, and then after I graduated college, I did a couple bodybuilding shows, and then from there, I realized I didn't really like bodybuilding as much, and I wanted to just show my strength, so I went over to the powerlifting world, and when I got hooked. So it's been since then, since I think that was uh, 2013. 2013 yeah. when you first started competing in powerlifting? Yes. Cool, cool. So. So, so you had a, so your dad, you said, competed in bodybuilding and stuff, and he kind of got you into that, that physical culture of, of strength training and stuff? Yes. Okay, yeah. cool. So. That's awesome. That's all I think me and my sister ever knew. He made our first squat bar out of a broomstick. Cool, so. sweet. Old school hardcore. Yeah. That's, that's great. 
So uh, what about you, Joe? How did, how did you kind of get your start? Um, Where did you grow up? Thing, things like that. Sure, yeah, I grew up here in Colorado Springs. Um, my background was more in athletics versus weightlifting. Mm -hmm. So um, I played basketball for years and years. I think I started when I was maybe seven or eight. Um, up until I graduated at, at 18 from here in town at Doherty High School. Um, after that, um, I went up to school at CSU up in Fort Collins, majored in psychology, but that's when I really started kind of getting more into lifting. I wasn't playing basketball. I wasn't running track anymore. Um, so that's when I wanted to get bigger. I wanted to get stronger. So um, I started hitting the gym, started learning and going from there. Um, once I graduated at CSU, um, I actually got into a sales position for about – year and a half or so and just didn't like it it just wasn't a good fit so I was searching for something that I was good at um, that I like to do um, so that's kind of what drew me back to the lifting world so I came back home um, here to the Springs got my master's at UCCS in sports medicine with a concentration in strength and conditioning um, so while I was in school um, I started personal training um, just to kind of get experience and everything like that um, and then once I graduated from my master's program Bounced around a little bit, but then ended up down at uh, Fort Carson. So I interned at Fort Carson in my master's program, um, and that's where I'm at now. So now I'm the head strength and conditioning coach at uh, Fort Carson for the 4th Infantry Division. Um, and then as far as the powerlifting side, um, it actually didn't start until um, Samantha and I were dating. She did her first competition, and I got her ready. And had kind of dabbled with some other powerlifters, helping them train for competitions, and you know, decided it was something that I was interested in myself and then went that route and just like Samantha said, just got hooked. Cool. So, um, is that how you guys kind of met each other then is through uh, um, kind of like your personal training and stuff and her and you prepping her for some competitions or? Um, yeah, actually it was it was a little bit before that. Um, it's I was, a really funny story actually. Yeah, are you, you so, can you share it or? Yeah. Okay, perfect. cool. Go ahead. So, um, <laughs> so for... I had to do an internship when I was getting ready to graduate, mm -hmm. and I just was looking through the list, and I saw that uh, there was, like, Joe Todd on the list, and he's a personal trainer. I was like, mm -hmm. that's going to be easy, because that's what my dad does. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I emailed him, and I was like, um, I'm looking to intern, and can, are you uh, accepting anyone? He said, no, not right now, but you can shadow me if you want. And I was like, cool, because I needed to shadow someone, right. too. And so, um, at the time, I was was going to school at CSU Pueblo, so it was about 45 minute drive from where he was at. And of course, you know, I'm a college student, so I'm running really late. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I think I showed up 45 minutes late, and I walk in and I see him, and I'm expecting because his name Joe Todd kind of sounds like an old man name. Right, it, right. It really yeah, does. Yeah. So I'm expecting an old man. So I walk in and he looks at me and he points at his watch, and I'm like, oh my god, he's really cute. I, I, am I supposed to be meeting him? And it was like right. 45 minutes late. So anyways, so I'm sitting there and talking, you know, he's showing me his stuff and whatever, and I told you my background, that I've been mm -hmm. training since I was five. Well, when we got done, I wanted to make sure that I could see him again, but not on a, like, profession or whatever, right, you know? Right, right. Like, and so I told him, like, you know, I really don't know what I'm doing. I need some help with training, and I just made up this whole story. <laughs> and so he was like, oh, yeah, you know, just text me, and, and we'll, we'll talk again, you know? And then from there, it was he fell in love with the, me, the, obviously. The rest, <laughs> but, the rest is history, right? Rest but then I told him the truth because um, my dad has his own boxing gym. I told right. you my stepdad owns Flex, and then my uncle owns a gymnastics gym. So I'm like, I have gyms galore. And yeah. when I told him, I was like, Dad, I really don't need your help on the training side. I she just did. wanted to see you again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's good. That's so, good. I, I, so I that's like how it. it started. But yeah. yeah, so I kind of maybe started on a little lie, but then yeah. I told him the truth. That's good. The truth, the truth eventually yeah. comes out, right? So um, Samantha, so because of kind of your background, which for me, to, to me and probably a lot of the listeners, um, it's a pretty unique background because most people aren't going to be uh, born into a family where their dad's bodybuilding and there's that strong presence of physical culture, especially nowadays um, in the society and culture we live in. So uh, did that ever kind of drive you away from lifting weights or was it just something that was so ingrained in you as, as a young girl that you just really enjoyed it and loved it from the get-go or was there maybe a time frame or time period in your life where you're just like you know I grew up in that and it just kind of maybe drove you away from it and then you came back how, how does that kind of look so I think it was very much ingrained in me you know something that I loved because even like um 
just small stuff, like even with my nutrition. I always, my dad always told me, you have to have protein with every meal. Right. So that's just something that I've always done. Now, for my sister, if you would ask her, it'd be a different story. I think I'd throw her a little bit away. Mm -hmm. So um, even though, you know, we're sisters, we're very much opposite. And she, she just, she likes to work out now. But like, just from what you said, I think being in, taught at a very young age, it's either you're going to love it or you're driven away from right. it. And we went opposite. I love it. And she was driven away for a while, but then she came back, you know, so. Cool. Yeah. That's kind of what I found with, with myself, my younger brother, because I started lifting weights and I was trained by a former Mr. California. And, um, you know, my younger brother, Brett and I both start at the same time, summer going into my fourth grade year, summer going into his third grade year. And I, I was bit by the iron bug like immediately. And then after a short time, he kind of fell away and yeah. has never really gotten back into it. So that's kind of why I wanted to ask about that. Because sometimes when you grow up in something, whether it be religion or, you know, right. some, something of, of that nature, a lot of times you'll see people that grow up in that are kind of forced in that, that, that when they get older and they can make those choices, they go away. But So it's kind of cool that, that you kind of just stayed consistent in, in that path of physical right. culture and, and strength training. That's, that's really cool. And so. that's kind of like what we talked about because we have a two-year-old. Mm -hmm. um, and right now we got her a, like a little bar set and it's plastic and she right. loves playing and stuff but I would never and my dad didn't do this to us either would force her to do it because I want her to be her idea and I don't you know if she loves it she loves it if she doesn't she kind of lure my sister out it's fine right. but um, just she's always around it she's always at the gym with mm -hmm. us everyone knows who she is so cool so um, Joe I'm gonna ask you just kind of how marriage has changed you as, as a man and maybe then also, you know, having, having your daughter, how that's kind of changed you. What is, what does marriage mean to you? What is it, what does it mean to you to be, to be a dad and, um, to be able to, you know, be that provider for your, for your family? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, marriage was uh, a huge commitment for me, but something that I've always seen that example of, you know, um, my parents have, are, are still together, been together 30 plus years. So, that was always something that, you know, in the back of my head when the time was right, I always knew, you know, I wanted to be in that position. So, um, you know, I, I think that going into marriage and being a husband um, meant a lot of things to me. But, you know, it meant that, okay, I had to be a provider. It meant that, um, you know, I had to be a protector. And, you know, a lot of things when, you know, Samantha and I were dating and, and seriously starting to get to that point, um, it drove some of the decisions that I made. Um, and I, you know, I think it worked out well, you know, when I was coming up on graduating from my master's program, um, you know, there were some options and things on the table as far as, uh, taking internships and strength and conditioning at, you know, various colleges and having to move and, and things like that. And, uh, you know, I talked to Sam, you know, her, her whole family is here, you know, her, her life is here and I talked to her about, you know, Hey, what if I have to move, you know, well, then what? She said, you know, wherever wherever you go, I'll go. And to me, you know, that sense of loyalty, um, that always stuck. So then decisions from there on out, um, I would make those based on us, not necessarily just me. Um, right. So, you know, when it got into, hey, I wanted to get into strength and conditioning, but I took um, an opportunity to be able to stay local, um, got into corporate fitness and wellness uh, for a little while, so that way I could kind of stay and work some things out. And um, knowing that's not where I ultimately wanted to be, but then that put me in a position to be down at Fort Carson, you know, right. as it is now I'm the head strength and conditioning coach there. So everything worked out fine. But, um, you know, to me at that point, that was so important to me to be able to take somebody else into account. Um, and even more so now with our daughter, you know, everything that I do, um, you know, I kind of try to do for them. I mean, I do things, you know, for me um, as far as training. Um, you know, and lifting that I do, but it always comes secondary. And, and you know, luckily I have the support from, you know, Samantha, from um, our daughter that mm -hmm. uh, we have shared interest. So Absolutely. it's not necessarily one of those to where I'm out lifting and competing and that's something that um, she's not really into. So, you know, that helps me. But, um, you know, I, I have to protect, I have to provide, I have to look out for uh, other people first. So um, thinking less about self and, and more about others. So. Awesome. Thanks, thanks for sharing that, Joe. That's, that's awesome. Um, so let's uh, let's take a kind of a step back. Joe, why don't you just kind of share with the listener if maybe somebody out there is interested in um, kind of the strength and conditioning field. I had a strength and conditioning coach on 
um, at the end of last year and stuff, and he talked a little bit about it. But I know um, I've got some connections in the strength and conditioning world, a friend that's up at uh, Washington State as an assistant strength and conditioning coach. I know for him, kind of that, that whole D1 process, it, it's a grind. I mean, yeah. I know he's taking internships where he's not paid, he's sleeping on people's couches, and it's yeah. just – it's it's just the, I guess again the best word to use is grind. So if somebody is let's say they're 17, 18 years old, they're getting ready to graduate high school. You know they they're really looking at becoming a strength and conditioning coach or or going in a direction like that. Kind of what what does the process look like to become a professional strength and conditioning coach? Not necessarily for Division One football or NFL or professional sport, but just being just being a professional in that field. Do you want to maybe just give a little bit of a background on, on that please yeah absolutely you know I think that's really important to be able to have a gauge on that fairly early on because you know this this strength and conditioning and getting into this field um, there's really kind of a, a track to getting there that you know if you want to be in certain places you kind of have to start early and, and make a beeline to right. there um, you know I was luckily able to kind of come in through the back door and do some different things and you know kind of position myself in some different ways but um, in order to get into the strength and conditioning field, um, you have to be able to have a, a degree typically in that field. Um, so, you know, you're 17, 18, um, you may want to start looking at uh, good undergraduate programs in exercise science, kinesiology, things that are kind of in that realm, similar to, you know, where Samantha was at at CSU Pueblo. Um, and then from there, look for a graduate program uh, in strength and conditioning in, you know, some form of field like that so once you kind of get to that point then you can at least in my head almost go one of two directions do you want to go more the research route or do you want to go more so the coaching route right. um, because there's a big difference you know there's there's universities that um, you know kind of specialize more in the research of things you know um, the exercise physiology and, and how you know training and adaptations take place and, and that kind of thing um, and then from the the practical strength and conditioning side of things the coaching um, you know, that's where you would get with the grad program that you would do, um, you know, your internship, or your grad assistantship in the weight room, working at that college, you know, working with teams, athletes, so on and so forth. Usually, if you're going that route, that's when you start making those connections. That's where you get the recommendations to, you know, get passed on to assistant positions or, you know, other internships to kind of further yourself in that. So it's really kind of a field to where you're having to be mentored, you're having to be groomed. Uh, you're having to just like you said kind of grind and wait until you get that opportunity uh, to be able to get into that spot so it's definitely one of those and, and we all joke about it but you know strength coaches we don't do it for the money right uh, we do it because that's what we love to do too, you know. right and the, the certifications just like Samantha said too um, in order to be considered a strength and conditioning coach you have to have your CSCS your certified strength and conditioning specialist certification which you need a four-year degree um, exactly. for um, and that's, you know, what's kind of get you on that track. Now, as you go along, you know, other things that you may pick up for me being on, you know, the military side of things, the tactical side of things, picking up, you know, the TSAC cert, the tactical strength and conditioning. And once you kind of get into that place, there's little spin offs or branch offs of where you can go, but it all kind of funnels from that, that same place. Cool. So, so absolutely have to go get a, a bachelor's degree. Yeah. And then if you really want to, dig deep into kind of the, the, the professional athlete, division one, that type of stuff, sports teams, you're, you're going to have to go get a master's degree as well, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, because I, I know my friend, um, I, mean, I mean, he got his, his undergraduate degree and then he had to go get his master's degree. Like that's just, I mean, you have to do right. that. If you want to work with division one, NCA, NCAA level athletes, like that, that's just the requirement. That's, right. that's just the, the baseline is yes. undergraduate, master's, get your CSCS, and then I think the experience right. and the certifications, yeah. all that, that's, that's just, you're just going to have to do it. Yeah, the experience is huge because it, realistically, when you look at, you know, how jobs are laid out and what kind of qualifications they're looking for, with some of these, you know, even entry-level uh, experience, you know, positions as an assistant, um, strength and conditioning coach or what have you, it's saying that you already have to come in with two years' experience. Right. Well, where do you get that? That's where that grad assistantship, that's where those internships start to come in. So you know, you're going to have to pay your dues before you get in the field for sure. Awesome. Well, thank you for sharing that. Of course. So for any of you listeners out there that are thinking about getting into strength and conditioning, um, not to deter you, but 
just like Joe said, it's it's got to be something that you that you love, and you've got to really start thinking about it and uh, setting those goals early because it's it's definitely a grind. And um, I, I just I know somebody else from from my hometown that was in that um, for a while, and then you know got out of and and became you know a, a civil servant just for the simple fact of it, it's it's just that grind, starting to ha- starting to have a family, moving around. Um, the benefits and all that stuff's not there, so you you really got to have that love and that passion. So, listener, if that's something you're, you're interested in, go for it. But just make sure that's that's a passion and, and a fire um, in your heart and in your soul before you before you take that dive. So, um, Samantha, I kind of I kind of want to just ask you um, about the importance of strength and just kind of the the whole physical culture and things of that nature for, for females. I know that's something that I've seen a lot lately because I competed in powerlifting when I was like a tween, early teens, like 12, 13, 14 years old. The powerlifting meets that, that I went to heavily dominated by males. There was a few females, but you know they were, they were older and you could tell they'd been in the game for a lot of years. And recently I've really seen a transition, which, which I love is females getting into, um, not necessarily, you know the the physique sports, which that's you know that's blowing up too. But a lot of females getting into the strength sports, whether it be weightlifting or powerlifting, and I think that's really cool. And you see a lot of messages through social media and stuff about you know females and being strong and uh, strong and sexy and all that type of stuff. So, from your perspective, have you seen that shift over the last several years of, of females um, getting involved in more strength sports? And what does that mean? For you as a female, having a daughter and the importance of that physical culture and, and being involved in those strength sports. So for me, I, uh, strength is very important. Um, just, you know, with my dad, he's always taught us, you know, being strong. Um, that's kind of why I shifted. I did a bikini competition first, and, you know, I did fairly well. I think I got a top five. I can't remember now. Um, you know, and it was one of those things that you can diet so hard or, you know, work out so hard, but it's always left in the hands of the judges you know it's very subjective um with powerlifting it's either you lift it or you don't you're either strong or you're not you know and it's it's you against you which I like too you know you can come in you can compete against others but at the end of the day it's just it's it's if you're strong enough or you're not strong enough um and so that's very important to me and that that I want to teach my daughter as well and I think that um because I've had a lot of females I, I started first as a just personal trainer and not so much in powerlifting and I had a lot of girls come to me and they're like well I want to look like you you know I just want to tone and I want my butt to be big and I want to tone my arms and I'm like well my butt didn't get big from doing glute kickbacks (laughs) it got big from doing a bunch of (laughs) heavy squats and I try and teach females that too like you can lift weights and you're going to look good you're not going to look manly ever you won't you know it's just going to if anything it's going to enhance what you already have right um, and I think a lot of females are starting to realize that that when they lift weights, they are looking good and they feel good too. You know, it's a sense of empowerment, um, and you don't have to do this like crazy diet or anything like that. You know, not taking anything away from the bodybuilding stuff, mm-hmm. but um, you can be aesthetically pleasing from the workouts you do. And I right. think that's a, a, a big sense for females because no matter if we want to admit it or not, you know, we're always worried about our weight. We always want to look at the scale, but with powerlifting, no, it's like it's just. It's, it's just so nice just to be strong. Absolutely. So, and that's something that I would like, that my dad actually taught me. Um, and my mom, too, because she, her background, she, when she met my dad, she did bodybuilding and powerlifting, too. And she's 58 years old, and she's still working out and um, cool. healthy as ever. And she can squat a lot for being a grandma. And she'll be mad because I told her age on the podcast. But <laughs> well, yeah, so, she, it's all good. <laughs> yeah. But um, my dad's the one that got all of us into it, and I think he really uh, was a big role model for us. And then now, as being females, you know, I want to be that role model for my daughters. So. Absolutely, that's that's great, and that's something I know for for me. Uh, just kind of one of the slogans that I try to live by in my own personal life, and it's kind of the slogan for the One Twenty Seven Fit Podcast is to be someone to follow. You know, and. I'm a school teacher. I don't have any of my own kids, and it's it's magnified when you do have your own kids. But it's like I take it so serious in my own personal life. It's like, hey, I'm a I'm a, a PE teacher, 
am I living, am I doing what I am sharing with my students? Am I being someone to follow? So right. you guys having a daughter, you guys being so involved in that physical culture and strength training and powerlifting, like that's, you guys, and then so when you go and share like, hey, we should eat this way or, you know, working out does this, it's like your daughter can see you every single day. She's spending time in the gym with you guys, so you guys are being people to follow for your daughter and then the other young people that you're influencing in your life. So that, that right there, just, you know, taking the action in your life is, is very, very powerful and setting that example. So um, I know, I just know for me, I, I teach uh, middle school um, physical education, PE, and so, you know, as the three of us know, it's kind of a, it's just a weird time of life, you know what I mean? It's just, there's a lot going on, a lot of changes, especially with the girls. The girls mature a lot faster than, than the boys, especially around that time, and um, I just know, like, that physical training and, and just that, that strength, I, I really think, like you said earlier, it, it, it um, helps just boost people's mood, and it just makes you feel so much more confidence and so much better about yourself, and that self-image, because I know around that age, you know, 11, 12, 13, like, you know, especially, with, again, going back with the girls, like that, that, you know, you're just so self-conscious and, you know, starting to like boys and all this weird, crazy stuff that's going on. I just really think that, you know, the powerlifting, the strength training, all that type of stuff is, is only going to positively impact a young girl. I mean, is that something that you would yeah, agree I'm, with? I totally agree with it. And like I said, um, it gives them something else to focus on, you know, like if they're focusing on how much weight they can lift instead of what they look like all the time, which it's fine, you know, you, everyone wants that certain appearance or whatever, but I just feel like being strong just makes you, it's just a whole different game, right. so. And the, the aesthetic side of things is going to come when you're lifting weights and you're training hard and you're, you know, you're, you're putting in the work in the gym. Again, the females, they're not going to look like a guy, because I hear that all the time, like, oh, I don't want to look like you, or I don't want to look like, it's like, you got so much estrogen, and if we're guys and you know, girls are completely different. It's not going to happen. So, but, you know, when you put in that time in the gym, the aesthetic part is going to come. Right. Like, a girl that is powerlifting, you can just, I, I mean, I can tell a, a female that's lifting heavy weights and, and powerlifting and things like that, maybe even weightlifting, like, their body is just different. They're, they're, they're tighter. They're toner. They just, right. they look better because they're just training. They're right. not necessarily training for the aesthetics to get on a stage to be a bikini competitor or bodybuilder or something like that, but just through that strength training, they just look, they look awesome. Right, and that's, so. that's exactly what I tell my female athletes too, and I've had a couple girls come to me and they're like, well, I just want to tone, and I'm like, just just give my workout a chance, and then if you don't like it, you can obviously leave. They usually don't leave. I've always had them stay, right. and they enjoy squatting, and then I even had one lady before tell me she doesn't want to lift any weights, and now she, uh, her friend will tell me, because I train both of them, that she'll look in the mirror and she'll flex, and she likes her back muscles yeah, and stuff. Yeah, so I think go. once you, once they start, they understand. And me and Joe always try to tell our athletes too, and we actually have a lot of female athletes, um, to fuel your body for performance. So not necessarily you need to be on a diet, but you want to fuel your body for the way you're going to train, you know. And from there, you know, your workouts and stuff, and then you'll have the aesthetics that will come later. But that's the most important part for us is fueling your body for performance, the performance, and then the aesthetics will come. Cool. So. Absolutely. I think with a lot of it, too, is that it, it's, a, it's a very physical thing, but I know especially for me being in that, that coaching role, to me I almost liken it to teaching. Yes, I'm coaching, but I'm teaching. So the, the physical strength is, is great, but that's really the, the outcome or the byproduct of what we're trying to get at. Because I feel like a lot of the things that uh, you know, we do ourselves, we ask our athletes to do, um, it is, a lot of it is more mental strength. It's, you know, we kind of learn these lessons through iron, whether it be delayed gratification or discipline or you know, being able to be mentally strong so that way you can be physically strong. You know, a lot of the times, especially, you know, when we get, you know, athletes ready to compete or, you know, they're coming up on a competition, as we get closer and closer, a lot of the things that I'm talking to these athletes about is more mental. Because at that point, if, if you're not mentally strong up here, the weights aren't going to right. move. Mm -hmm. If you start to doubt and question yourself, that's where you're going to get yourself into, into trouble. And, you know, so with our athletes, with our daughter, those are kind of the lessons that we use from the powerlifting, use from the strength training is, yeah, that's great what, you know, this person can do physically, but how did they get there? What lessons, you know, are, are they taking from getting there? And those are the things that we apply back, especially having a daughter. Now a lot of this becomes real world as far as, you know, the lessons that we do at the gym. You know, if she does get into sports or lifting or training, 
how we train is how we handle other situations in life. If you can be patient, if you can work hard, these are the things that come from it. We have this physical manifestation of this is what our hard work has gained us. Bigger muscles, bigger, to- bigger totals or what have you. But, you know, and, and a lot of times, too, even for me being down at Carson, younger soldiers, these are the things I talk to them about. If you can apply these things in training, you can apply this to your finances, your career, how you move up in rank, so on and so forth. So um, it, it, this is just kind of our mode of being able to teach. Some of them don't even really know that we're kind of going to these places with them, but you look at the transformation from some of the people that we've worked with physically, that mental transformation has also, you know, come a long way as well as far as how confident they are, you know, their self-esteem, you know, even some of them, their, you know, careers and so on and so forth. You know, I've had, you know, clients that I've worked with that are so inspired by what we've done and the change that that we've made physically, they go out and get personal training certifications or or whatever. So um, it's physical, but again, this is a tool that we use. Right, cool. So uh, Joe, in regards to just the the mental game, in regards to uh, powerlifting and then life, what, what, is there a tool or tools that you use to kind of help your, your athletes or the people that you're coaching to kind of get focused and stay focused? So is there like maybe a quote or mantra or just maybe um, uh, like a quiet practice or something like that? Mm-hmm. What, what tool do you kind of use to, to bring that mental strength out of, out of your, your clients? Sure. You know, that's an interesting question because I feel like depending on who you're talking to, Everybody is very different. Um, just the other weekend, we had uh, three new athletes, and they were competing in a competition for their first time. And um, after weigh-ins, we went out to breakfast, and we were talking and everything. And I was just kind of letting them know about how the next day would go in terms of the competition. I told them, I said, everybody's very different. We've got one guy on the team that uh, he's, he's one of my guys from the Army. He's a uh, real nice guy, but he's very quiet, kind of more internal. And I said, you know, for him, I don't necessarily need to be, you know, pumped up, screaming, yelling type of thing. You know, I can just go and drop little bugs in his ear. You know, hey, th- th- this is your weight. This right. is your time. You've put in this time to train. And then I leave him alone and then just let him simmer on it. I can tell he's just, you know, kind of processing. And then we have other athletes on the team. They're very high energy and they feed off of that energy. And to them, it's, you know, the focus is there, but they have to be able to feed off that energy to be able to, to do the lift. So I'm jumping up and down and I'm high-fiving and I'm doing these kinds of things. So it's very individual for every athlete. And this is kind of, you know, ironically, even though I didn't stay in psychology, this is kind of where I feel, so, you know, I can pull from some of those things because everybody's a little bit different. I have people that, you know, I've had, you know, one of my athletes was a, a soldier. He's out of the Army now. But he's been deployed. He's seen things and, and he's told me, he said, you know, from what I've seen and where I've been, I'm not scared. I'm not scared of weight like that. I never go out there thinking I'm not sure if I can lift this. It doesn't intimidate me. So I treat him much differently than maybe I do you know, an athlete who's new and says, you know, I, I've never lifted this before. I'm nervous. I don't know if I can do it. You know, and I have to play those very differently. You know, I have to instill confidence in one, and sometimes I have to be the voice of reason in the other. Um, so it's a very individualized approach. You know, everyone talks about from the standpoint of, you know, their programming or their workouts being – tailored or you know individualized to to that athlete we do the same thing mentally so you know my approach with some athletes is very different sometimes I'm just you know being encouraging and positive and and I may be at a meet and I'm not you know talking loud and hyping them up I'm just very quiet I pull them away you know when I'm working with Samantha she's very internalized she's got her headphones in and I don't really talk to her very much and she knows if I, I come and you know tap on my ear for her to take her headphone out, then I have something that I need to tell her real quick, and then I tell her, and then I you know put it back in. Yeah. And I have others we're just laughing and, and joking and shooting the breeze literally minutes before they step out onto a platform to make them feel calm and comfortable. And hey, it's just a regular training day. Cool. So it's so it's coming from a coach's perspective, and a, a teacher's perspective. It's learning and knowing each of your athletes. Exactly. Right? Because the more comfortable that athlete feels, the more confident they'll feel. Right. And especially in a competition standpoint, when they feel comfortable, they'll perform better. Um, it's already a different environment than most of them are used to. That's not how we train necessarily. I can't simulate, you know, an eight hour meet 
and you know the ebbs and flows of that in you know one training session so they're already out of their element a little bit so anything that i can do to make them feel at ease to make them feel comfortable to give them the energy they need to be able to do well that's what i have to do so uh especially coaching you know sam and i have to wear a lot of different hats especially right. on meet days mm -hmm. cool so uh <coughs> samantha you touched a little bit on eating um a few minutes ago is there any like for powerlifting specifically, when you're talking to your um, clients and, and team members and things of that nature, is, is there kind of a direction that you kind of point them to in regards to maybe like macros or anything like that? Do you want to just maybe share a little bit more specifically about yes. your guys' eating philosophy? So it's the same thing. It's just everyone's so different. And I, right. and I try to explain that to them too. Um, I like to go on the higher carb side, low fat, and then obviously your proteins one gram per pound. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of what I do just because I feel like the carbs, especially for the amount of weight you lift and stuff, it's just better feel for your body. Um, and then it, it's just anytime you're talking about diet and if you're wanting to lose weight, you're going to play with your carbs and your fat. And for me, honestly, I think carbs are going to give you more energy, so I'd rather you do that and do lower fat. You can go both ways if you're trying to lose weight, so it would be either low carbs, high fat, or low fat, high carbs. But for powerlifting, that's just my preference, and that's what I have my athletes do. Um, sometimes it works, though, and sometimes it doesn't. Everyone's body responds differently. And I think the biggest thing, especially being a female, that you need to realize, carbs tend to make you hold more water weight, and that's okay. Um, it doesn't mean you're not losing body fat and gaining lean muscle. Right. Um, I think that's the hardest thing for my females to to realize and they'll keep telling me like well Sam I'm gaining weight I'm gaining weight and I'm like it's okay it's okay to gain weight especially if because powerlifting is at the weight class sport um week of a week out we can lose that water weight it's fine you know there's different ways we can cut it out safely um I wouldn't say to do more than probably maybe five maybe seven pounds for a female guys can get away with uh more water weight cutting mm -hmm. without it affecting meat day um but I try to explain that to them and I think honestly that's the hardest thing for my female athletes to realize it's okay to gain that water weight. And it's, it's hard, it's hard to differentiate it unless you know you got a, however you want to take your body fat and it's not easily, I don't know how easy it is with that bod pod if they have. Right, um, uh, you always have access army or whatever, to some so. more accurate modes of measuring. Yeah, so I think yeah. it's, it's, and that's this one of the things that I just tell them, and you know, the same thing like Joe was saying, it's just, it's like a life lesson. You know, if you can be patient, if you can trust me and stuff with this, it's going to come, but you, it, there's no quick fixes, you know. I don't believe in any of the uh, pills or bad diets, bad and diets or stuff, anything right. like that, you know. It has to be a lifestyle change. And I tell them, too, I said, and it has to be something you want. You know, it's not a big deal to be in this certain weight class. I'd rather you do it to be healthy, and I want you to do it for your performance. So if this is something you want to do, and I try and tell them, it's not what I want you to do. It has to be what you want to do, because otherwise, you know, you're just going to keep falling into bad habits, so... So the, uh, you, a word you just used that I love is lifestyle. People have to realize that, just like you said, there are no quick fixes. There are no, you know, all these crash diets and fad diets. And you see the Hollywood stars, like, will you get some temporary uh, water weight mm -hmm. loss? Yeah, you will. But in the long run, you know, for longevity and wellness and long-term health, all that, all that stuff is, is unhealthy. Right. You know, so let's say let's say you, uh, Samantha, have a have a female come to you, and she's going to be a, a new client of yours, and, and she she's never never really lifted weights. Maybe she's afraid to lift weights, like you know you said the, uh, earlier that some females I don't want to lift weights because I don't want to get bulky and big and all that. Let's just say somebody a female comes off the street, comes to you, she's going to start working with you. Let's let's put the the strength training and gym time aside for a moment and let's just talk about the nutrition because I know with females with with young ladies out there you know losing the weight and you know all that type of stuff is it's a, it's a big thing I mean people make millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars every year selling fad diets and all this type of stuff especially to females so if this client is gonna come in she's gonna start working with you what is gonna be the first thing that you're gonna look at in regards to her diet or the way she's eating and, and how are you going to approach that with her? So basically, you know, I kind of ask her how her nutrition was anyways and what she eats on a day-to-day -day basis. And then from there, um, basically, I think, because I've done many different um, 
diets, I guess if you want to call them. I've done the high protein, high fat, no carbs at all. And then I've done only carb cycling around my workouts and stuff. The best thing I found is that if it fits your macros, basically. Mm -hmm. um, I think that gives everyone the freedom to eat more of what they want. But I tell them they should still go on the more healthier side for the health benefits. Right. Yes, maybe that like, so basically, we'll start there. And then from there, I'll explain to them what if what fits your macros means. And de kind of depending on their goals, like if, you know, like you said, we're putting uh, working out aside, if that's not really your goal, try to make it something more moderate, maybe more even across the board with the carbs, the protein, and the fats. And then from there, you know, kind of figure out their percentages on how we want to do that and their total calories um, without getting too into depth about it because we'll be here all day. But yeah. that's kind of how I would start with them. And then I'd go from there, like, it depends on the kind of person you are. If you are hungry all the time, I would say stay more on the healthier side because you're going to get more meals out of the healthier foods because they're lower in calories. Um, if you're that kind of person that maybe just eats one meal a day, maybe two, you can go on the, the uh, for lack of a better word, I guess, the bad side. You mm -hmm. know, so. But if you're that kind of person that has a food problem and you can't have that one donut because it fits into your macros, you have to have two or three then stay away from that food, you know? It's, I kind of, I always relate to like an alcoholic. Yes, you know, they want to have that one drink, but they can't have that one drink. So I'm sorry that you want that bad food, but you can't have it. So it depends on if you have a food problem. And I think the biggest thing it's hard to get people to admit it to is like food, it is, it's an addiction if you have a problem yeah. with it. So if you have a problem with it, then maybe you know if it fits your macros isn't the best plan for you just because you can't do it you know just like an alcoholic they can't take that one drink so um i try to explain to them you know like here you can still try it but i would stray away from it just because it has to be like we talked about before it has to be a lifestyle change and until that person's ready to make that lifestyle change then i can't you know i can help them all i want but they have to be the person to make that absolutely. change so absolutely just using the reference that you use or the example you used a minute ago is going back to alcoholics. I mean, an alcoholic, until they, we can have all these interventions and go to AA meetings, but until they realize like, hey, I've got to change, I've got to be the one that wants this, it's, 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 there is going to be no change, and, right? And yep, and that's the hardest thing to, you know, and you know, I try to explain to anyone that wants help, I'm like, you know, and they tell me, they're like, well, I've tried all these diets before, none of them work. I'm like, it's not the diets that don't work, because no matter what diet you do, as long as you're in a caloric deficit, it's going to work, you're going to lose right. some weight. Mm -hmm. But so it's, it's you, you know, and, and you have to, you have to, like Joe said, we wear many hats. You have to, when you're approaching that kind of situation, because they do, they do have a problem and you have to, there's a way you have to go into it, you know, and it's just, it's, it's hard sometimes. Um, yeah, so. Yeah, and, and so I just want to make it clear too for the listeners that there's a big difference between eating for aesthetics and eating to lose weight and then eating for performance. Right. right. So, uh, Joe, if you just maybe want to touch on that for a minute, like, hey, if you want to lose weight and things of that nature and, and look better naked and stuff like that, you're, you're going to eat a certain way, you're probably going to eat certain foods. But if you're going to get into the performance side, whether you're in the military, whether you're um, powerlifting or, you know, trying to play Division One football or basketball, any type of performance, that's going to look different. Do you want to yes. maybe differentiate a little bit between the aesthetics and the losing the weight? and maybe the longevity health wellness side and the performance side, Joe? Absolutely. It, I mean, anytime that you're talking about performance, things change. Everything from the programming, the workouts that you do, and you know, just like you said about the nutrition. Because at that point, <clears throat> you obviously want to be able to take in foods that you like, that you enjoy, that taste good, so on and so forth. But that's not priority number one. You know, for, for me, on the opposite side of the coin, um, you know, a, a lot of males and females, but typically females, you'll see, they, they want to lose weight. They want to, you know, look a certain way. And guys on the flip side, well, I want to gain weight. I want to build muscle. I want to do these kinds of things. There's plenty of times that regardless of, you know, how good the food is, I have to eat so much, it's not always comfortable. I don't always right. feel like eating. But I know that in order to perform at my best or if my goal for that particular period of time is to build muscle or whatever, the calories are the calories. If you want to take in 4,000, 4,500, 5,000 calories a day, you have to eat. Oh, well, I'm full and I don't feel like it. Or, 
you know, this food used to taste good, but now I eat some, it doesn't matter. Because then you've already set the priority as performance. And I think that's really where the differentiator is at, is the priority. If the priority is weight loss, or if the priority is aesthetics, then that's the priority. And, and we find this uh, a lot with what we do, and Sam, Samantha and I have to be very um, dialed in and pretty hard set on what is your goal? What's goal number one? Because then everything will go off based off of that. Oh, well, I want to look a certain way. Okay, well, I'm just telling you now, you can't always look a certain way, eat at a deficit, be strong, and build muscle all at the same time. Your body doesn't respond to that. You need to pick something, and we need to work that goal for a while until your body adapts and you see those changes, and then we can change directions. Um, and, and, you know, performance is no different. Just the number one goal for that is, is how you perform. So I know that if my goal, you know, if I'm competing and my goal stepping on the platform is to be able to move more weight, it doesn't really matter if I have a six pack or if I don't have a six pack. Either the weight's going to go or it's not. And, you know, obviously I've been doing it for a little while, so I know what my body responds to. I know I kind of have a sliding scale of I can still be fairly lean and go out there and lift well. Right. But there's a certain point to where when my body weight starts dropping, I notice that in, in some of my lifts. Oh, I don't feel as stable on the bench. I don't, you know, feel quite as grounded when I squat when my weight dips below this weight. So then for me, that's, you know, that drives the goal. Okay, if I need to stay, you know, maybe in this body fat range or, you know, at this weight to be able to, you know, achieve the total that I want, that's how I have to eat. You know, or, or on the opposite end of things. You know, if I'm trying to get into a weight class, I need to get my weight down. You know, maybe I'm running 10 pounds too heavy and I need to get here. Well, then maybe I am hungry, but maybe I just drink a glass of water and go to bed. And that's, you know, that's the end of it. So right. it's just, again, just like we talked about before, um, it's the, the actual nutrition side of things, but it's the mental side of things. A lot of it's just discipline. Yeah. When you set that priority, it's not about what you feel like. It's about what you said that you wanted to accomplish and doing things by any means necessary to be able to get there. Good stuff. So let's, let's dig into actual powerlifting and what that is, because I know um, the listeners from your guys' end, they're, they're going to know what powerlifting is and, and the three lifts and all of that type of stuff, but there's probably going to be some listeners out there that really have never been around powerlifting. They don't even know what the term powerlifting is or the difference between powerlifting and weightlifting and you know bodybuilding and all that. So uh, Joe, if you just want to kind of say, share with the listener, like, what the three lifts are within powerlifting, kind of what a meet looks like, just kind of some of the, the basics, just quickly, sure. so somebody out there that maybe doesn't know even what powerlifting is, they, they can kind of follow the, the rest of the conversation. Absolutely, so uh, powerlifting, keeping it pretty simple, it's, it's a sport. So when you compete, it's different than necessarily how you train, it's the same way as you know, an athlete would train for football and then they go and compete in a game on Saturday or Sunday. That's what powerlifting is. We train for a meet, and then we go and do the meet. So when we get to the meet, um, you've got your three lifts, squat, bench press, deadlift. So the whole goal of the competition is to increase or have the highest total of your best attempt out of those three lifts. So you have three attempts at each lift, um, and basically you're held to certain standards. You know, in the squat, do you hit depth? Um, can you listen to the commands of when to squat, when to rack the weight? bench press, coming down to the chest, pausing, waiting for the command to be able to, to press, the deadlift, making sure that you know, you're know you at full lockout. Everything is standardized. You know, So when you come in the gym and maybe you hit a PR on you know uh, a particular day, that's great and not taking anything away from that. But when you're in a competition, everything is standardized. Everything is judged. Um, so whether you think you hit the weight or not, um, you know, you have people holding you to, you know, a certain standard. So when you go into a meet, like I said, you have those three attempts. Um, it's a long day. It, it usually ends up being they'll, they'll kind of break the amount of competitors into different flights and space it out. So even though we're only competing or completing nine lifts in that one day, right. uh, it may be a six-hour, eight-hour day yeah. based off of who's going. So it's, it's a very different environment. Um, but, you know, that's powerlifting. You know, we, we train hard. Um, we train our weak points to be able to get to that competition that particular day and be able to showcase what we've trained uh, trained for. So, you know, like I said before, when you step out onto the platform, it doesn't matter what you look like 
or what you feel like or how good your training went up to that point. It's really a showcase right here, right now, in front of these judges, in front of these people. Can you lift this particular weight that you you know set yourself out to lift right. or can't you? And it's very black and white. You got the lift or you didn't. Yep. So then they take your best lift out of the three, they put it together for that total, and then that's how they decide on, you know, from a competition standpoint, who's the best out of that weight class, who's the best overall lifter for that day, et cetera. Cool. What's, what's the difference between equipped powerlifting and raw powerlifting? So equipped powerlifting, you would basically use tools or gear to be able to aid you in that lift. You know, so whether you're wearing a squat suit, a bench shirt, um, to be able to help you move more of a load. Um, so that's still powerlifting. On the raw side of things, you kind of have two different areas. You have completely you know, raw or just the raw category to where you can use uh, knee sleeves, a belt, and, and wrist wraps, and that's it. So that's all that you compete in. So basically a lot of that load you're having to do based off your own strength, not being able to use a tool. And then you have raw or classic raw with knee wraps. So the same things apply, the belt, the wrist wraps, but now instead of sleeves or bare knees, you can use knee wraps to help you, uh, assist you a little bit on that squat. Um, but everything else, your bench press, your deadlift, is, is done without any kind of aid. So um, you'll find all those categories at any powerlifting meet that you go to. Um, so it's not necessarily, oh, I have to do a separate meet if I wanna do one of these things. We would all get together but then it just really depends on that day, however many people sign up in which category, who you're actually competing against. Because you could share the platform, somebody you know may go out right before you or after you, it's in an equipped category, squatting in a squat suit. And then I come out there right behind them and squat knee sleeves. But at the end of the day, we're not being compared against each other. Okay, so for, for you guys specifically and your team, do you guys compete raw for the most part or yes as of right now we don't have any lifters that uh compete equipped um you know that's something that if the time came down for it sam and i would definitely coach we don't necessarily have a hey we only take these kinds of lifters right. um but it's really evolved um a majority of our lifters lift completely raw just you know either bare knees or knee sleeves a belt and wrist wraps yeah. um this is kind of getting into the first venture where even any of our athletes are going to be doing classic raw with knee wraps. Um, I'll probably be one of the first ones doing it for me out of uh, necessity. I had an injury earlier in the year, so I'll be more so using knee wraps to kind of help add some you know, support and stability to uh, my quad and my knee uh, that mm -hmm. I injured earlier in the year. So it, it's just a gradual evolution for Sam and I. Before we had a lot of raw lifters, so our training went you know, one particular way and we focus on certain things. And that's the biggest thing, like I said, whether it's equipped, classic raw, regular raw, uh, you're still powerlifters, you're still training, but the focus of what we uh, are, you know, where we need to put our focus may vary a little bit. If I'm, you know, in knee wraps or a squat suit, that changes the strength curve. Maybe for yeah. a raw lifter, the toughest point is at the bottom of the squat, where now, you know, classic raw or equipped, maybe I get a little bit of aid at the bottom of that lift. So now the toughest part is, coming back up to the top or being destabilized. So basically all we do is we just tailor our programs for that lifter to be able to address those weak points or where the lift is gonna be most difficult. So cool. um, it's just a gradual evolution for us. Okay, now in regards to the, the training side of things, we talked about the nutrition. I just wanna to touch a little bit on the training. Do you guys have like a um, specific method? I know like I, I you hear the like Louis Simmons and the conjugate method and there's all these different uh, players within the strength and conditioning and powerlifting world, they all kind of have their own methods and stuff like that. Is there a specific method or a specific way that you guys like to take most of your team members or, or clients? Yeah, I mean, I, I think a lot of that programming, it, it varies based on the time of year um, okay. in terms of are athletes competing right now? Are they getting ready for a competition or are they in their kind of quote unquote off season? Um, you know, so off season is, you know, if we don't have a meet coming up and, and we're just still generally training, we're focused on different things. So maybe it, it, maybe it is weight loss, maybe it is building muscle mass instead of the main priority being, you know, moving more weight. That's good for a lot of our athletes. It gives our bodies, you know, times to, uh, you know, just let our CNS calm down a little bit, recover, um, you know, work around injuries, whatever that may be. 
Um, and things might look a little bit different when we're in competition prep. There's less variety in the program. We're more focused on uh, being able to move that total. But I think coming up, I know for me personally, I, I dabbled in a lot of different programs when I was coming up and I was right. learning, whether it be, you know, West Side and the conjugate method, you know, whether it just be straight linear or, you know, Windler's 531. I, I mm-hmm. did a lot of all these things. So I have a lot of these influences. So now being a coach and that, you know, I'm, I'm designing and programming and creating, you know, my own programs and templates, I pull from a lot of those different influences. So I can't necessarily say, hey, it's one thing. But, uh, it's a Spartan program. He came up with his own program. Okay, yeah. So we'll, we'll call it the Spartan program. That, so Spartan, because I mean, kind of when you hear the word Spartan, it's very uh, minimalistic. It's very just kind of basic and simple. Is that really what you try to focus on? Is just keeping things basic, simple, and yeah, you know, to a degree. I I, I think that uh, some of the programming, depending on the athlete, can change. It could be a little bit more complex depending on. Um, the training age of the athlete or, or you know where they're at in their exactly. lifting career but I think the thing for me is uh, is very simple about the program is we focus on your weak points mm-hmm. if you have a weak link in your chain that's what's holding you back from totaling more so that's where we put our focus in now the training methodology may change a little bit depending on how we want to target that weak point or you know where we're targeting that weak point or whatever's going on. So that's the simple part is that, you know, well, Joe, how do you train your athletes? Well, I, I train their weaknesses. If I can make their weaknesses and, and make them stronger or turn some of those weaknesses into strengths, they're going to get stronger overall. Absolutely. There's a lot of different ways to skin that cat, but mm-hmm. that's, you know, that's basically it. So we've kind of over time, you know, developed a template that we think works very well for us, for our athletes. Uh, we I've both kind of train very similar. Kid. Yeah, you know, so coming along, yeah. So he's come a long way, though. I mean, he's been uh, <coughs> programming me, like I said, for, from 2013. Mm-hmm. I got top 10 ranked for in USPA, and that's all from him. That's legit. Yeah, yeah. so um, he got me pretty elite. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> now, but but training, because that's that's like one word I take away from our conversation up to this point is individualization. I mean, mm-hmm. and that's the, the whole thing with health and fitness. I don't care what niche you're in, it's it's individualization, making things personalized, but there's a big difference between training a female, like yeah. Samantha, your wife, and training a 21-year-old male, right? Yes, so a, again, it goes back to that individu- individualization, personalization, and just really going back to knowing your athletes and, and what they need, their background, and all that, right? right. right. Yeah, I, I think that's a big part of it, and I think that that starts to creep in more uh, the higher that the training age is. Samantha's been doing this for a long time. Right. And even from when we really started focusing on powerlifting from you know, 2013 to you know, now going into 2019, she's in five or six years, so she, our programs have developed, she's developed and, and grown. Um, but I think when you start talking about individualization, there really kind of becomes this, well, everything should be different and should be catered to me, and, and my program should look drastically different than somebody else's. We kind of have to look at it from the nutritional side too. Look, regardless of who you are, we're still counting macros. Right. You still need to get X amount of calories in. Now, whether you take in 45% carbs and somebody else takes in 30%, that's where the difference lies. Right. So especially having a team and, and multiple athletes and whatever, um, even just from a time efficiency standpoint, uh, there's not enough hours in a day for me to just write completely different programs exactly. for everyone. Good point. So we have a template. You know that that we use and has worked very well for our athletes, and that doesn't necessarily make a cookie cutter. But I can go down the line and say, hey, for this particular block, this variation that we're going to use is going to address X Y Z weak point. Well, maybe Samantha's weak point on squat is getting out of the hole. Maybe such as such as you know weak point is you know stability or you know uh, you know hip strength of the hips, their knees cape when they squat or whatever it is. Okay, well maybe Samantha gets this exercise, and maybe you get this one. But maybe the sets and reps and intensity same. are still the same. Right. So there's you know there's differences, but there's a lot of similarities because at the end of the day, we're all power lifters and we're still all training the same three lifts. Yep. So there's going to be a lot of carryover, but then there are going to be you know areas where we do need to individualize. That's as well. that's 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 a great point there. I I, I appreciate you sharing that. Um, Samantha, what what does the word culture mean to you and to Joe and? to your team and your gym and, and what you guys are really trying to create through um, Spartan Barbell? Um, I think, well, we've talked about this before, what we really wanted to is just make a big family. And that's what it feels like. Um, 
I mean, our athletes, they've, they become our family. We have some that, you know, they'll ask the manager what we need for the day, what we need for the gym, and they'll bring it. Um, everyone's comfortable with each other, and that's really what we wanted. And I think I've heard, I've had people come to me, and, you know, they're like, well, I was at this gym, and I just I didn't feel, you know, welcomed or anything like that. So we try and make everyone feel welcomed. And I think the powerlifting community in itself, it's a, it's a huge family. Everyone feels very much appreciated. So I think... Um, I think we've done a good job at yeah. doing that. So, what's the what's the uh, basis behind Spartan for for you guys personally? I mean, we all have kind of certain uh, things that pop up in our head when you hear the word Spartan. I mean, when you Google Spartan, you get the Spartan obstacle course race. You know right. what I mean? So, there's all kinds of kind of Spartan terminology and things thrown around. But for you guys personally, and 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 your family and culture that you're trying to create what is what is kind of that whole spartan thing mean to you guys sir sure. so so for me spartan it means a few things it means strength whether you're talking about physical or mental it means hard work uh nothing that any of us on the team have gained in, in terms of our total or just you know su- success in any realm of life has come easy so that comes with hard work and then dedication um anything that we do is not going to come overnight you just like how we talked about with strength and conditioning earlier, it's a grind. You're not always going to feel motivated. You're not always going to want to do the work that you have to do, but how dedicated are you to reaching your goals? So those three things really, I feel like, encompass what Spartan means to us and and how we approach our athletes and and just, you know, like you talked about, the culture. That's the culture that we drive there where, you know, we're a family, we have fun, we laugh. We cry, we do all these kinds of things. But at the end of the day, those are the three common things that kind of the glue that binds us all together. Awesome, beautiful, thank you. So strength, hard work, and dedication. Very cool. So um, Samantha, for you, and then after you answer, uh, Joe, you can go ahead and answer uh, the same question. Has there been one person or a couple people specifically within the powerlifting world maybe that you look up to or that's kind of motivated you or, or continues to, to motivate you? Um, honestly, like I mentioned before, probably my dad because okay. he's the one that got me started. My dad and then um, his training partner, Mike Barber, uh, he was very much into powerlifting, and he actually trained with Ed Cohen and cool. all those big names. Um, mm-hmm. He's known Mike Barber's known me since I was five, and you know ever since I told him like I want to do powerlifting, he's took me under his wing. He's gotten me ready for competitions, you know, along with Joe and stuff. And then, so probably those two guys are probably my biggest. Awesome. Influences. What about you, Joe? Uh, you know, I, I think for me, there's been a lot of people that have, that have helped me along the way, uh, but as far as you know, inspiration was motivated me. Uh, as corny as it is to say, honestly, is Samantha. Um, you know, she was a big driver for me uh, to get into my first competition. She competed, and, uh, you know, to be honest, I can talk about it now, but I was nervous. I didn't think I was strong enough. I didn't think that I was ready, but seeing her be able to do what she, you know, did at her first meet, uh, you know, that got me into it, and, and being able to see some of the obstacles that uh, she's had to work through and overcome. You know, she was prepping for a competition when she found out she was pregnant with our daughter and uh, she still trained even while she was pregnant. She came back and dropped the baby weight and has competed again and you know has traveled you know, uh, to different meets out of state and at nationals, all these things and what she's been able to accomplish. So uh, she's always been uh, an inspiration to me and, and has really always held me to that standard too and, and always you know pushed me. I can definitely, especially with our team and you know, our family and everything. I, I always consider myself as a coach first. Um, I'll put my family, I'll put my team ahead of my own training, what I need to do. And uh, Sam always is kind of grabbing me by the horns and say, hey, you're an athlete too, you train. What do we need to do? Do we need to tweak your schedule? When do you need to lift? What do you need for me? Uh, you know, when I was coming back from my injury, making sure, did you rehab today? You know get that look off your face you know everything's gonna be fine you're gonna come back so she's really been kind of that person for me that's that's motivated me and inspired me in this realm and and I think that's something else taking away from our conversation today is just in your guys's relationship as a husband and wife just that unity and that Mm -hmm. kind of that like-mindedness and that focus of like hey you know we're husband wife we're mom we're dad we're coaches we're trainers Mm -hmm. we're, we're business owners like I think that's really powerful yeah um, for marriage and just you know any type of relationship 
um, is, is just kind of having that, that direction, that same direction that you're going, right? I mean, because that's, yeah. that's what I'm really taking away from you guys. Oh, like, yeah. hey, Samantha's focused on the same things that you're focused on, vice versa, right. and there's just a, a beautiful um, just oneness kind of right. moving in that, that same direction. Yeah, you know, it was it was funny. Just a couple of weeks ago, I was talking to you know, one of our athletes on the phone, and uh, you know, I was telling him about you know being able to come back and compete again in, in my first meet since being hurt. I'll, I'll be competing in April, and um, I told him, you know, just kind of how big of a, a driver Sam was, you know, for me. And I, I thought about it. I told him, I said, you know, she's she's my compass mm -hmm. in terms of my own lifting, but in terms of everything, our family, our business. Uh, you know, she she keeps me steady. She keeps me on track. She balances me out. There's nothing that I would do, uh, training, business, family wise, without getting her input and everything first. Right. So it, it's really kind of a yin and yang relationship. Yeah. And it, it's funny because there's you know uh, a huge majority of the time those are all good things. And you know I I feel supported. I feel confident in, in what we have. But it's not always easy. Mm -hmm. We're around each other a lot. Right. You know, and there's times that, you know, we butt heads and there's times to where, you know, I'm coaching her and I'm wearing my coach's hat right. and she needs me to be wearing a husband hat. Yep. And, yep. you know, di different things. It's not always easy. But, um, again, the, just kind of those, you know, lessons through iron, lessons through marriage. You know, these are the things that we, we go through. We, we, when we train, we put strain on our bodies to be able to adapt, to lift more, to build muscle. And that's the same thing Sam and I have been able to do with our relationship. We've gone through things that have only made us stronger right. and made us more equipped to be able to, to do and handle the things that we have today, to be able to go from just a team of a few people to growing that team, to getting our own space, to mm -hmm. you know doing all these kinds of things. Um, so it's been huge for us, absolutely. Great. Thank you for sharing that. We're gonna, we've been going over over an hour now, so I wanna res be respectful to your guys' time and uh, kind of wrap things up here. Uh, one, one of the final questions I have here, we'll start with you, Samantha, and then um, go to you, Joe. Is there one or two gym pet peeves that you have? Because I know for me, being in the gym for a long, long time, <laughs> I've seen it all, or I think as soon as I think I've seen it all, there's something, some somebody's doing something crazy again. So maybe is there one or two gym pet peeves that that you have? So probably my one of my biggest pet peeves is I hate when you're on the platform, you know, doing your deadlift or squat, and someone walks on it or walks in front of you. This we have a smaller space now, so kind of it's it happens and it's right. okay. But especially mm -hmm. when you know you're still at flex and someone you know you're finally get and they walk right in front of you or they stand right in front of you and stare at you. I'm like, no, no, don't do that. Yep, yep. <laughs> so that's probably one. And then um, especially now having our own gym, just putting stuff away. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, and like obviously when you're at someone else's gym, you're like, nah, you know, who cares? I'll just leave this collar on the floor. Right. But now at your gym, I'm like, oh, put it away. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's my two. What, what about you, Joe? Yeah, I, I think that it's changed a little bit, especially now owning a gym, I think like Samantha said, I, I tend to be more of an organized person mm -hmm. anyways. Mm -hmm. um, but now, especially having a gym, when, when things are left out or, you know, uh, things are left behind and they're not in their, their right space. And that's something that I've had to grow through, especially having a toddler because that's, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> she's in the gym and right. just things that you would never even think would be in the gym. Why are there crumbs on this bench? Right, or, you right. know, why is there chalk or dry erase on the, the windows? What's going on? <laughs> But, um, you know, that, that's probably my biggest one is just organization. Just yeah. leave things how you found them and, you know, keep things up. Because especially, yeah. you know, and that goes with our family. And, and they've all been very good about this. But it's like, hey, you guys all know that Sam and I aren't around 24-7. So that's your home, too. So pick it up. Leave it how you left it. And, you know, they've been pretty good about that. Yeah, yeah. So. Cool. yeah gym etiquette is something that, I, I just really feel like a lot of people they don't even they don't even get it. I mean, just like walking when you're getting ready to do a squat or a, um, you know a deadlift or power clean if you're on the platform and if somebody just I mean they just like walk right in front of you. It's like, dude, dude, you, you don't you don't do that stuff. Like no, people, right. I honestly people just don't. And I think it's again it's just kind of the way our culture is going. Just different thing that's that's going on. But like I grew up in a very old school hardcore 
bodybuilding, powerlifting, you know, you put your collars on the bar, you put the weights away. I mean, just, there was just kind of like a routine or a certain way that you did it. But I mean, I've gone into gyms now, like a lot of, especially these bigger, like global gyms and stuff. Like, I mean, the thing that, one of the, one of the biggest things that gets me is like the dudes that are like, let's say they're doing flat dumbbell bench press with the hundreds, you know, and then they, they slam down the weights. It's like, dude, like, you're, you're not stronger because you can slam down the weights. <laughs> you're, you're actually, that's why when you pick up the hundreds next time, they're like bent mm -hmm. because, I mean, I'm just like, like, just, just set them down. Like the guy that trained me, he always said, and obviously it stuck to me in my mind all these years is a quiet lifter is the best lifter. Now, obviously powerlifting and different things, I don't always agree with that because sometimes you got to let out a little grunt or something, but just kind of that, like, Hey, like you don't have to be the center of attention. You know, just let your training, you know, do the talking. But guys slamming down weights, and you know, I mean, I was I was at a, at a gym earlier in, uh, last week, and you know, this guy, man, he was just hawking loogies and just being loud, and like, I'm just like, like, dude, come on, man, like, just just chill, like, <laughs> yeah. you don't have to be all. I mean, it's just it's just an attention thing. It really is. You yeah, know, you like, you know, especially with the guys, like, you know, you walk into a gym, guys are strutting their stuff, and they're you know got their string tank tops on and it's just like all right man i don't know I, and i used to do that stuff too so it's you know i can't really say a whole lot but just the gym etiquette nowadays seems like it's non-existent especially when you go to those bigger gyms so yeah. like people with like chalk like i was always the guy that taught me how to do powerlifting like we would use chalk and stuff but he would always and, and it's something that's stuck in my mind he's like he would always have chalk on the platform he would always spend time at the end cleaning it up you know what i mean it's just it's just like hey it's just like your bathroom or your room at home it's like you, you clean up after yourself yeah. in the kitchen you know but i've actually know. been lucky enough to never been to a commercial gym so yeah you, that's <laughs> right you're yeah you've got a lot of sweet stuff going so for you i've that's never great. had that experience well it's it's an experience <laughs> let me tell you so um all right so i'm just gonna wrap things up here with you guys i just want to ask you um one one more question and again we'll start with you samantha and then go to you joe what what excites you drives you motivates you just honestly um probably my daughter now it's always I want to I want her to be the strongest that I could be but now I want to be the strongest I can be for her and just be a role model for her cool Joe uh, for me is progress in any form whether that be in the gym and you know hitting PRs or totals going up or in business watching our team you know grow and, and do different things we never thought possible uh, you know with our daughter watching you know the different phases that she's going through and how she's growing and changing and just in our marriage and you know where we started and you know where we're at today and what we've built the, the things that we've done so progress in any form is, is what motivates me and excites me and and drives me to keep doing what I do very cool and and just finally Joe is there anything that you would like to share with the listener or leave the listener maybe that we didn't touch on anything that you know just really excites you, fires you up, something that's burning inside of you that you, you just kind of want to maybe throw out there before yeah, we stand here? Absolutely. I think, you know, kind of tying it back to, you know, what Sam and I do and, and why we started Spartan Barbell um, is try. Put yourself out there. I, I think that, you know, powerlifting is a sport that's growing, but um, I found a lot of people that are interested, but, you know, well, you know, I, I don't know if I'm strong enough. Right? I've never done that before. I've lifted weights, but I've, I've never gotten into this before try because we all started there you know and, and we have people on our team I think the youngest athlete is 16 and the oldest is you know maybe 45 46 and, and everybody in between and, and everybody's starting from a different place but uh, you won't know your potential unless you put yourself out there Absolutely. you know so regardless of where you're starting from especially with the culture that we have you know the hard work the dedication all those kinds of things you could do that from wherever you're at you know and, and getting back to the progress thing that's what you'll make if you actually make the decision to put yourself out there and try do a competition you know come to the gym start training and you know what if you don't like it that's okay there's a lot of different options and ways that you can go but i think a lot of people are, are just stop themselves or are not follow through just out of fear and, and out of you know just the uncertainty of i don't know what i'm getting myself into um but what we have as spartan barbell has helped a lot with that because we have a lot of people that can kind of rally around new athletes and hey this is where we started too and mm -hmm. you know I never even thought I'd get into powerlifting you know I've been doing it for years and 
uh, you know, being able to kind of welcome. So that that's what we all try and push as a team, but just get out there and try. Cool. Just kind of going off of that, because we've had uh, female athletes that barely could even squat the bar, and now they're squatting over 300. So just, you know, just like he said, then you just get out there and try it. Even if you don't think you can, you can't. Absolutely, so. yeah. And, and that's, that's, that's for life, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. if, if you, you, you never know unless you try. Absolutely. So, cool. Absolutely. Great, great stuff. Thank you. So I'm going to give you, uh, Samantha, Joe, both of you, whoever wants to kind of share. Um, if somebody is listening to this and they want to get a hold of you for coaching, training, nutrition, what have you, where can um, the listeners uh, reach out and, and get a hold of you guys? Sure. Uh, we've got our, our brick and mortar location, Spartan Barbell. Uh, we're at 6056 Hollow Tree Court, located right next to uh, Flex Gym and Fitness. Um, any inquiries about you know training, programming, the gym, competing, um, you can hit us up at info at spartanbarbell.net, um, and we'd be more than happy to help you out. Okay, and then I know like uh, you guys have Instagram. People mm-hmm. can maybe reach you guys through Instagram yeah. too or so our, Facebook. Our, yeah, our Instagram handle is spartanbbell, so spartanbbell. Okay, cool. Very cool. And then Facebook, too? And Facebook, yeah. And they can find us on Facebook. And okay. It's under Spartan Barbell. All right. Great. And so for you uh, local listeners here in Colorado Springs, um, if you guys uh, you guys can just Google Flex Gym, which is which is an awesome gym that I train at. It's hardcore, old school, bodybuilding, powerlifting gym. Spartan Barbell is literally connected to that gym. So if you know where Flex Gym is, you'll find uh, Spartan Barbell as well. So, um Joe and Samantha, I just want to thank you guys for your time today. Thank you for having um, us. For just sharing your story, sharing a little bit about um, powerlifting, nutrition, and uh, marriage, and, and a wide array of, of other things. So thank you for your time. Thanks for thanks for hanging out with me today. Thanks. thanks. So uh, listeners, thank you for hanging out with the three of us today. And um, if you guys want to reach me, and I'm always looking for feedback, and I, w- I want this 127 Fit podcast to be the best that it possibly can and um, positive, negative, indifferent feedback is, is something that will, will help me make this podcast better and um, just ask better questions and things of that nature. You can reach me on Instagram at 127fitness, Facebook at Quentin Vars, and then I also have the 127fitness uh, at 127fitness Facebook page. My website, which is just uh, some writing blog stuff, is 127fitness.com. And if you guys could um, do me a huge favor and like, subscribe, share, and then most importantly, if you're listening to this podcast episode on iTunes, leave a review. That just helps uh, That helps the iTunes world get this podcast up, gets, gets more listeners and, and, and things of that nature. Please, please do that. That, that would be a, a huge help for me. Um, if you guys have a guest um, or you think you would be a great guest for the 127 Fit podcast, you can send me an email, get a hold of me through 127fit at gmail.com. And I will leave you guys uh, per usual with Proverbs 2410, which states, if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. This time until next time, I'll catch you guys later.